Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Iron Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, Theresa May wraps up her tour of Africa by whipping out her dancing shoes once again. This time in Kenya, it's the first time a British Prime Minister's visited the country in 30 years. She's trying to whip up business ahead of Brexit next year. Also, fears, of vi fears that violence could escalate in Soweto following the deaths of at least three people in xenophobic attacks in the Johannesburg Township. We take a closer look. And in Mauritania, one candidate, opposition leader Biram Da Abied, is hoping for a parliamentary seat from this weekend's elections, but is unable to campaign as he was arrested three weeks ago on charges of violently threatening a journalist. His supporters say he was set up. But first, UK Prime Minister Theresa May was in Kenya on Thursday, wrapping up her whistle-stop tour of the continent. She's the first British Prime Minister to visit the country in 30 years and is trying to drum up more trade ties ahead of the UK's exit from the European Union next March. After meeting with President Uhuru Kenyatta, May pledged security and development funding for the region. She also visited British troops in Nairobi and whipped out her dancing shoes once again as Kenyan scouts and girl guides helped launch an anti-plastic event in the capital. Julia Steers tells us more about what Kenya got out of May's bid to rekindle their relationship. Kenya certainly got quite a bit out of it. They signed two deals between May and Kenya's president, Kenyatta, one of which was to promote more military cooperation between the two countries, and for the other for the UK to support President Kenyatta and his administration's fight against corruption by agreeing to return any assets that are held in the UK um, that were gained by corruption here. May, as you said, also committed that UK troops would continue to train alongside Kenyan troops here and said in the coming days she would be announcing uh, a financial package to support Amazon. That's the peacekeeping force in Somalia, of which Kenya is a large contributor. And lastly, she said that the UK would help support the establishment of a center here in the capital, Nairobi, to combat cybercrime. So on several fronts, both economic and then militarily and financially, in support of these projects, both against cybercrime and more importantly to the UK and to Kenya against terrorism here and in neighboring Somalia. So Thursday was the final day of May's Africa tour. Was it worth it for her, the heading out to the continent? Well, for May, particularly, as you said, as she leaves the, as the UK prepares to leave the EU, she was really on message in all three countries saying that Britain would shift away from the strategy of giving aid to African countries and really start to see them more as investment opportunities and as real trade partners. Um, also, particularly here in Kenya and in Nigeria, she, she stressed the importance of partnering to combat the growing threat of terrorism in both countries and in Somalia. But on the economic front, it's important to note that Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya combined um, only generate about 13 billion billion pounds uh, per year in terms of trade with the UK. And if, as the UK prepares to leave the EU, the EU generates about 500 billion pounds per year of trade. So, you know, it, it really remains to be seen whether or not she can make up this huge gap left um, simply by fostering more investment and more trade with these African countries. Julia says there for us in Nairobi. Now, lawyers for Ugandan MP Bobby Wine say that he was stopped from boarding a plane for the United States where he was hoping to get medical treatment. Police reportedly violently abducted him and put him in an ambulance. The singer, whose real name is Kyagolani Sentamu, faces a treason charge. He says that he was severely tortured whilst in jail and his arrest led to days of protests and international calls for his freedom. The government says that he can travel after state doctors examine him. Another lawmaker allegedly recently hospitalized by police was earlier also prevented from boarding a plane for India on Thursday. There are concerns that President Yoweri Museveni is cracking down on the opposition. There are fears that violence could escalate in Soweto following the deaths of at least three people in xenophobic attacks in the Johannesburg township. At least 27 people were arrested over looting that targeted foreign-owned shops after a Somali shopkeeper allegedly opened fire on robbers this week. Nicola Schumer has more. 
The police have just been told there is an alleged looter inside the Soweto shop. Several shops belonging to foreigners were looted in the township on Wednesday. Tensions rose and several people were killed. Initially, the attacks began after local residents accused foreign shop owners of selling expired food products. Many of the shopkeepers who were beaten came from Somalia and Ethiopia. I was feeling when they were kicking me by the stones on my head. I think three or four stones they were kicking me. They, I don't know, they are plenty guys. I, they are, I think they are, they are more than 100 people. So how can I say? And then somebody was throwing me outside there and then they were kicking me. And we are four guys. Foreign shop owners feel abandoned by the authorities. There is no government who is controlling these uh, crimes. And we don't have any protection from even the police, even the government. No police come to you and ask you what is your problem. Attacks against foreigners have been frequent in recent years. Some South Africans accuse them of stealing the locals' jobs. In Southern Africa's economic powerhouse, 40% of young people still have no job. The worst bout of xenophobic violence took place in 2008, when 62 people were killed. South Africa is on the brink of bringing in a minimum wage that many hope might go some way to address the huge social inequalities in the country. The bill's been passed and is now just waiting on a signature from President Cyril Ramaphosa to become law. Our correspondents report. It was President Ramaphosa's flagship project. The National Minimum Wage Bill was eventually adopted in Parliament. And uh, the voting shall commence. The majority of members voted in favour of the bill, therefore the bill is agreed to by the House. Many think that this minimum wage, a little more than 200 euros a month, is too low. But for the ANC-led government, this is the first step. That is a tool that we never had before. That's why we appreciate the start. Even though the start is low, but at least we have a foundation that we've laid here. It is also a long-awaited victory for the unions. They estimate that more than six million workers will improve their lives with this new legislation. So this is a huge step forward, but we also continue with our campaign for a living wage in each of the sectors where we engage in collective bargaining. Some employees will benefit more than others. Domestic workers, for instance, as well as farm workers, are earning less as they have seasonal jobs. For this association, working with women in rural areas, the new law does not change much. Um, already, some farmers have started to pay the 18 rand an hour, but on the other hand is that they have reduced the number of hours uh, that women are working. The new legislation has other unfortunate consequences. Farmers have now no obligation to house their staff, as they used to during apartheid. Elizabeth, whose deceased husband worked on the farm, has now been asked to vacate the cottage she spent 20 years in. Farmers will have a field day with workers. They will literally ask any amount of money um, or deduct any amount of money for rent. So it will have devastating um, effects on farm workers as well. One out of four South Africans live under the breadline. Some fear that such a well-intentioned law will indeed bring more poverty in rural areas. In Mauritania, political parties gearing up for legislative, regional and local elections this weekend had until Thursday night to campaign. One candidate hoping for a parliamentary seat, though, hasn't been able to canvass support. Top opposition figure and anti-slavery activist Biram Da Abed was arrested earlier this month on charges of assault. His supporters say that it's political sabotage. Sarah Sacco reports. These activists' candidate for parliamentary polls can't campaign for himself. Biram de Abade was arrested three weeks ago. Nevertheless, his supporters are out canvassing in his name in the suburbs of Nwakshot. His wife says the charges brought against the politician were trumped up to hurt his chances in Saturday's polls. In the 2014 presidential election, we came in second after the ruling party. Since then, the government has always tried to prevent us from campaigning. They've forbidden Biram Daabid from organising meetings. The anti-slavery activist faces up to five years in prison for allegedly violently threatening a journalist. He could still win a parliamentary seat on September 1st, as his candidacy has been greenlit by the Electoral Commission. At the headquarters of his Sawa party, his supporters are concerned about his long-term political future. 
The government will not let Biram campaign. I'm afraid that they will hold Biram until 2019 to prevent him from running in the presidential campaign. The ruling party fiercely denies the systematic harassment of President Mohamed Ould Abdelaziz's biggest political opponent. If he has a problem with the law, he must answer for his actions. Why did he, during or before the campaign, create problems for himself with someone? He's generating media attention for himself with this case. But he won't get the Mauritanian people's votes by demonizing the regime because everyone knows what this regime has achieved. Biram Da Abeid is Mauritania's most prominent anti-slavery activist. The practice was officially abolished in 1981, but an estimated 20% of the population remains enslaved. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care. France 24, four news channels in four languages. 430 journalists, 35 nationalities, 160 bureaus around the world. A global reach. 355 million households in over 180 countries can watch France 24. 61 million viewers watch the channel every week and the numbers are constantly growing, with audience figures up by 31%. France 24 Online is also forging ahead. Over 18 million visits a month on France24.com. With 45 million videos viewed online, France 24 is a leader on YouTube. While our 37 million Facebook and Twitter followers make us France's number one channel on social media. To our constantly growing community of viewers, thank you.